Um, so welcome, everyone. It's good to see everyone. Um, th this is the second part of the series on practicing religion. And uh, last week, we started with um, Judaism, which uh, I, I confessed to the group that was here, huh, I've been to several other services, but it's not really one that I studied. So I, so I blame that on Bill for choosing this topic because he made me do a lot of homework last week. <laughs> but this week, <laughs> but this week I kind of know a few things about Christianity. So, uh, so, yeah, so we're, um, this, this part two, and we'll be looking at the, the practices of our Christian faith. Uh, and then the subsequent weeks, uh, Dr. Bill will be um, uh, looking at the, the practices of the other world religions, uh, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. So uh, with that, why don't we uh, pray, start with prayer. Things happen when we pray, right? Well, gracious God, we give you thanks once again as we come together. Um, and uh, for this evening, uh, Tuesday evening uh, uh, classes, Lord, we pray that your spirit uh, be with us as always and, and just bless us in this time as we uh, look at these uh, different practices uh, of the various religions. And, uh, and tonight, uh, again, look at the practices of our Christian faith uh, just to, to gleam upon uh, the meaning behind them as well as uh, what makes them significant in our spiritual walk. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to uh, just bless us in this time, and may your spirit be our guide and our teacher always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, again, last week we looked at Judaism um, and the different practices, and one of the things that I pointed out uh, with, with the Jewish faith is because, again, the Jewish faith even though it, it started, uh, or we, we would date, date the Jewish faith as being almost 4,000 years old, I guess, if you go all the way back to the time of Abraham, right? 2,000 years to Jesus, and then 2,000 years before that was Abraham. Much of the practices actually uh, doesn't get solidified until um, uh, after the Babylonian exile and even after um, uh, after the time of Jesus, because a lot of the practices of current uh, modern day Judaism apply to uh, practices that's not centered around the temple. And the practices that were centered around the temple, um, uh, early Judaism up to the time of 70 AD, were all changed. So, um, but once the, um, uh, in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed by the Romans, and the Jews had spread out, and by that time, there were Christian communities spreading out. Much uh, of the, the Christian communities were, of course, part of the Jewish community. And so when we, uh, today, when we're looking at the practices of the Christian faith, you're gonna see a lot of similarities <laughs> because you're gonna, we're gonna be adopting the, the, the Jewish uh, practices, yet at the same time, have a different twist in its understanding and meaning, okay? So, all right, we have, we have PowerPoint now. So, Judaism to Christianity, this is what I was talking about, you know. So there is a connection, of course, and there is a translation. One of the things, um, uh, last week when we looked at uh, the, the individual practices of Judaism, we, we looked at these three aspects, uh, um, the practice of prayer, uh, we didn't really look at the scripture, um, Hebrew scripture, um, but, we, uh, but one of the aspects of Judaism was the observance of the Sabbath. Well, we take, in many ways, Christianity takes those practices and kind of um, redefines them to our Christian context. So again, as uh, um, I spoke last week, in Judaism, prayer is probably one of the, the, one of the most basic practices of the individual um, practice of religion. Uh, Christianity takes that and kind of, again, transforms it. Now, whereas in Judaism, much of the time, you don't have extemporaneous prayers. In, in Judaism, there is a book called the Siddur. Siddur? 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 S-I-D-D-U-R. Um, which, which is like what I would say is like our, in the Anglican church, um, Anglican church tradition, the Book of Common Prayers. And much of the prayers that are said in um, the synagogues or in Jude Jewish worship are recitations from the book. It's already pre-written, 
and um, the, the, the role of the worship leader is to know which prayer goes with which context of worship. Whereas in Christianity, we have a mix. We have a mix of these. We have a mix of recitations versus, uh, as well as extemporaneous prayers. Uh, we have the recitations, um, even within our book of worship in our Methodist church, there is a whole section, uh, the, the 800 section, that are a list of prayers that we, I, I can adopt and I use in worship. Some, a lot of times when in our worship service, there are prayers like after the, uh, after the offering. There is a prayer dedication, right? Where it's printed on the screen. You guys don't have to figure out what should I pray now? It's up there, right? So those are prescribed prayers. Uh, sometimes I do write them, but those are what, what, what you would say are prescribed prayers. Or, you know, so then the, the act of praying would be more of a recitation. But that's not the only way in the Christian faith prayer is exercised. In the Christian faith, there, much uh, of, of, of the prayer is done extemporaneously, whether it be praying at home individually. At, individually. Um, when you're uh, at home, when you pray before your meal or um, morning prayer or evening prayer, how many of us actually take out the Book of Common Prayers and look for one, right? We may open up the Bible and have a psalm that we can recite, but most of the time when we pray, my guess is in the Protestant tradition, we, a lot of times we just pray what is on our hearts, right? So, so there is this combination of, of um, it's no longer just a, a recited, something that is already set, fixed, but one that ex exercises in our Christian faith a individualism as well as, uh, I guess, on the moment context. In a way, it's, it's, we, we, would, we would gleam upon that as, as your spirit moves. We pray as the spirit moves. And the way we pray varies in the different branches of our uh, Christian faith. You ha I have several pictures there, right? You have a picture of an individual praying. We have a picture of a communal prayer. <laughs> and then you also have prayers that are not so quiet, right? How, how many of you have ever been to a worship service or a worship context or a prayer meeting where prayer may be led and prayer may be said by a leader, but then there then allows time for individuals to pray. And uh, have you ever been to a prayer meeting where everyone prayed simultaneously out loud, right? So that's a practice, and uh, it, it's actually very common in the, uh, some of the ethnic traditions. Uh, I know in the Korean tradition, it's called Tong Song Gido, where everyone prays individually as loud as they can. And the reason why you pray as loud as you can is because it's so noisy, you can't hear yourself. Um, and if you're afraid that someone else might hear you, it doesn't matter because everyone is praying so loud, they can't hear anyone else, right? But that's a practice. Um, and uh, the African-American tradition also has that, where you have, um, in, in, in our branches of Christianity, uh, uh, the branch that's more from the Pentecostal um, movements have that sense of extemporaneous uh, praying exuberantly. By the way, the Pentecostal church came out of the, I know, we you know, just blame it on us for everything. Uh, so anyhow, yeah, but it's part of our, uh, part of, part of the, our Methodist tradition. Uh, the, uh, the, our cross and flame, the flame actually represents the Holy Spirit. So the movement and, and just leading of the Holy Spirit is part of our Methodist tradition. But again, different ways of praying, right? So practice of prayer. There, um, there, there's both a combination of recitations, but as well as extemporaneous, individual as well as communal. Now, I'll get back to the communal in a bit when uh, we get to worship. But again, various ways of prayer. And prayer, again, is central to many of uh, the religions. It's, it's definitely central in the Jewish faith. It's, def it's, it's one of the key components of our, our, our spiritual practices in the Christian faith. 
Um, it's key in the Islamic faith, as well as many of the other. Um, scriptural study. Scriptural study is another aspect of practice, uh, Christian discipline practice, um, that's one of the basic uh, uh, spiritual disciplines in the Christian faith. Now, that being said, scriptural studies um, can vary quite a bit in the Christian faith, as you know, right? So first of all, um, it, it varies because uh, there are two ways of studying scripture. There are, um, when we look at uh, uh, scriptural, um, not scriptural, spiritual devotions or spiritual disciplines in the Christian faith, there is a whole section on personal devotion, taking quiet time at home, individually, or wh wherever, as an individual spending time studying, reading scripture, reflecting upon it, um, studying it, whether it be memorizing it or looking up um, uh, commentaries on it as an individual, but there's also then the practice, which is much common in the context of a group, group Bible study, right? So again, I'm sure many of us have engaged in both individual studies as well as group studies, um, either now or in the past. But the big thing uh, that, that differs within the range of the Christian faith in, in terms of how we study scripture differs because of the varying interpretation of scripture. How do we view scripture kind of dictates how we are going to study it. And of course, um, in terms of this, um, you know, our scripture, we have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament. Some branches of Christianity have the Apocrypha, like the Catholic Church has the Apocrypha, which is the 15 books between the Old Testament and New Testament. Some of our Orthodox churches have extra New Testament books. Like, for example, in our, um, in our Bible, in our Protestant Bible, we, ha we have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, right? In, in some of the uh, Eastern Orthodox um, churches, they also have a 3 Corinthians. It's like, well, where did that come from, <laughs> right? It's not in our Bible. Actually, parts of it is already in our Bible. They broke up the 1 and 2 Corinthians differently. And that's how they get. So what does that say about scripture, right? It's not, it, it's, not, um, it's not one that is predefined, right? We, when we talk about scripture, it, um, you know, our biblical scripture, we use the word canon, right? It, it, that it was canonized during the 4th century um, AD uh, where the church leaders had all these different manuscripts and texts and, you know, some, some old guys got into a room together and decided, hey, there's all these different interpretations. We've got to figure out which ones are the ones that's going to be authoritative, right? And, so, and, there, and there was a, a long process. It's not that simple. But there was a process of canonization. Now, what does the word canon mean? The word canon actually means a ruler. Not a ruler as in an authoritative ruler, but a ruler as in a straight edge. The, the, pro, the process of the canonization was to set a general rule of these, these are the texts that's going to be the, the ones that kind of sets the, the baseline of our faith. Okay, so the word canon means a rule, as in a ruler, to, uh, uh, to kind of dictate things that are consistent with what's been canonized is consistent with the faith, and things that are not consistent are then going to be considered heretical, right? So that's what canonization did. It doesn't mean that this is the word of God and the stuff that's not, not inspired at all. It just means that the, 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 the word, the books selected were um, the, um, what the church fathers back then considered as being, okay, these are the ones that's going to set the standard for the Christian faith, okay? Now, that being said, um, the, uh, some branches within our Christian faith look, up, look at the 
the Bible that has been canonized, and especially in, in John 21, it talks about uh, uh, that uh, the, the scripture are wholly inspired and nothing shall be added to it or taken away from it or blah, 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 blah. One of the views of our scripture is that it is not just inspired, but inerrant, right? There, there is infallible. So uh, branches within our Christian faith and tends to be more of the uh, more conservative, more uh, fundamental uh, view of our scripture is that they view it as being the word of God. And because of that, if you view scripture as the word of God, then how does that, de- or that, how does that translate to then how do you tra- uh, study the Bible? You wouldn't engage in biblical criticism of wondering, okay, so what did this manuscript say versus this manuscript? What does the King James, you know, how, how is the King James uh, interpreted versus the New Revised Standard Version versus the New International Version versus the Message? You don't do that. Instead, what it says is, it, it, it is what it says, right? As that, as that phrase goes, um, what is it? God said it, the, the Bible I don't know. Okay, there was that cliche, right? I said it. No, the Bible said it. The God said. God said it. Bible said. It. There you go. Something like that, right? The Bible said it. I believe it. Some something. Anyhow, basically, the the the, the practice there then is that um, in uh, certain branches of our Christian faith, the basic mode of biblical study is memorization. Is straight memorization and regurgitation because that is the way in which scripture, if it is the inerrant word of God, you want to recite it as accurately as possible. Now, is that going to be the, uh, the King James Version <laughs> or the, you know, we don't know. Most of the time it's the King James Version. But that's one way. Versus um, more progressive, more um, liberal or more mainline churches, like the Methodist Church, we view scripture as being more of being inspired by the spirit. And what I mean by inspired by the spirit, that means the writers, you know, and the writers doesn't necessarily have to be the, whoever's name is on the, 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 the top of the book you know, that you're reading. But whoever the writers were, were inspired. In, in, whether it be um, inspired in a way that they felt very convicted in their faith and, and and what they wrote down was their authentic testimony of what they believe was what they believe. So these are testimonies, and thus we use the word uh, Old Testament, we use testament. These are testimonies, right? But because uh, in, in that mode of understanding scripture as being more of testimonies, then we start looking at some of the biblical tools of criticism. What, the, what does it really mean? What did this writer really try to convey and what was going on in, that, in, in the context, the social, histor- historical social context that this person would believe something like that or say something like that, write something like that. Right? It's a totally different way of studying scripture. Right? And so you have studies, biblical studies. When you do personal devotions, it's just you, you read the scripture and you kind of glean from it, well, okay, what, what, what is God trying, you know, what is, the whole, what is the spirit trying to say to me through the scripture? You know, what, what, can I, what can I glean from it? Versus when you do group studies, there is then discussion and the varying of interpretation versus someone just saying, this is what it means, right? Take it or leave it. So you have these, again, varying, varying practices when it comes to scriptural study. But when you, most people, I don't know what's happened through the years, but in Psalm 23, you know it from the yeah. King James Version mostly. And does it get changed now? Do, do the young people recite it? So that, okay, so you bring up a very good question about, so whatever happened to the, the practice of memorizing scripture? I mean, how, how many of us, how many of you grew up memorizing Bible verses as a child? I think we all did, right? And I myself have a selection of 
favorite Bible verses, right, that I, that I go back to. Um, Psalm 23 is one, as you mentioned. Uh, I love uh, reciting the Psalm 23 in the King James Version. Yeah, I do too. Now, when I recite it, do I think of it as, this is the word of God, and so I better not change any, uh, a single word of it? Or do I think of it as, this is beautiful poetry, <laughs> right? And there's inspiration when I recite it, especially, uh, you all know if you've um, attended a memorial service, um, uh, one of the, the practices that, um, you know, that I do is uh, I invite the congregation that we all recite together. And now if, if I try to have everyone recite it in their own translation, it would just be a mess. So I usually write, print the King James Version in the bulletin, <laughs> And I tell people, let's just read it all together the way it's printed, <laughs> right? And it sounds beautiful. Right? So that's a practice that helps us, again, reflect upon scripture, but at the same time, yes. And, and whether we memorize it or not, uh, we approach it as understanding that there is poetry and there is, uh, there is a heritage that inspires us, but not necessarily to say that every single word um, is a dictation from God, right? Which is going to, which is very different than um, one of the other traditions that I know Bill's gonna get into, where um, uh, 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 scripture in the, some of the other traditions is truly understood as a, um, a dictation or a the, the word of God. So it does vary, and again, in some branches of Christianity, believe it's the word of God. But we do have this spectrum. Which language? Greek? <laughs> I know, there you go. Translation and language, right? And even you get to the Greek. Well, yeah, but then is the Koine Greek or the Septuagint Greek? You know? So it's like, you know, there's... Say Arabic. From Muslim point of view, Arabic. Oh, the Quran. The yeah, Quran has to be Arabic. And he... Bill will get to this, I'm sure. It has to be Arabic, and it cannot be translated to any other language. If once the Quran is translated, it is no longer the Quran. But you know, the, in the Jewish faith, the same way when they have a bar mitzvah, bar yes. bar mitzvah it, they have to do it in Hebrew. Yes. Well, and, and much of the um, again, there's something about the language itself, the poetry that, that um, when you're in, in the context of worship, there's con uh, it conducts us in a way that it, it, it transcends the language. Um, but again, going to the, now Christian worship, just like uh, I'm talking about the different ways of prayer, prayer practices, different ways of Bible study. Well, worship in the Christian um, context, there is no right way <laughs> or wrong way. And many churches have bought and broken up <laughs> based upon how they worship. You have traditional uh, worship. You have a very orthodox type of high, what we call high liturg liturgical worship. Um, you have praise and worship, right? Now, it's a matter of taste and preference. It's not, I wouldn't say it's not like uh, you know, one day I feel like having soup versus salad. Um, it's, it's, people will naturally gravitate or, um, um, uh, yeah, gravitate to a style of worship, bas basically whatever they feel comfortable or what speaks to them. For many uh, folks who grew up in a certain tradition, that will kind of guide them to a, a style of worship versus someone that hasn't. Again, there's no right way or wrong way. But how, how the worship is conducted, no matter what the, 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 um, uh, the styles differ, there is a commonality in every single Christian worship. Every Christian worship has these four movements. Why? Because this is what we picked up from the, the, our Jewish brothers and sisters. It was the, 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 um, the four movements of worship in the Jewish faith, and it, that just translated into um, the Christian context. The four movements are simple. There's a gathering. 
call to worship. That's what we always have to call to worship. There is a calling, gathering the people forward. In the Jewish tradition, it was when the, the, the sofar was bl blown and people um, came, came to the temple for worship. Uh, there are the Psalms of Ascent, which, which talks about going to the temple. And, 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 and worship began not once you entered the temple, but on the way to the temple. Think about that when you come to church. Worship begins even before you come to the church. So on the drive here, I remember, oh, I should have, I have a video, this wonderful video of, of, of this family getting ready for church. <laughs> it starts off with the alarm going off and the mom and the dad waking up going, oh my goodness, we'll be late. And they're, they're, they're screaming and yelling and, pe and people just running into bathrooms and it's just chaos, right? You know, exactly. And, and the kids trying to find their shoes and you're trying to figure out what to wear and, and mom trying to um, prepare breakfast while getting dressed and, and all of that. And of course, even on the drive to the church, there's like logistical plans being made and, and dad's shaving in the car as he's driving and then, and then, and then one of the kids scream and he gets scared, he slams on the brakes and he accidentally shaves his head. <laughs> Anyhow, that's a comical stuff. And then they walk into the church and they're like. <laughs> <laughs> Worship in the ancient tradition began even before you got to church. There is that sense of preparation, right, before you get there. Um, um, I'll get into the Christian calendar, which actually talks about that. That sense of preparation is actually uh, one of the, uh, an important part of the practice of faith. So, but then, okay, so you have the basic pattern of worship, you have the gathering, the calling, then you have the proclamation, which includes the scripture reading and the message. The, the, the sermon is not the main part, actually, it's, it's not at the end, it's actually, um, it's, it's part of the, the, the proclamation, um, it's actually in the middle of the service, right? And the different traditions, again, the different denomination has a different emphasis on that um, either scripture reading or the proclamation or the, uh, the sermon. In some, some um, contexts, such as the Orthodox churches and the Catholic churches, usually there's like four scripture readings. Okay, there's a, there's, there, there is a, um, a set standard of scripture that is assigned for each Sunday. Some churches read all four of them. We here pick one of them. <laughs> you know, it's just one of the, the, the different things. Sermons, you know, my sermon tends to be pretty much, you know, give or take 30 seconds, 20 minutes long, right? I don't time it, it just ends up that way. After 20 minutes of write, or, uh, writing my sermon, and after 20 minutes, uh, I have nothing else to say, so I just say amen. So it's 20 minutes. But uh, I'm sure you've been to some traditions where sermons can go as long as an hour or even longer. And in, typically in the Catholic tradition, it's not called a sermon, it's called a homily. Yeah. And usually what, five, 10 minutes, yeah. you know? So it varies, right? In the Catholic tradition, the, 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 the sermon is not the high point, right? It's the communion, which is part of what we, it's the third part called the response. So there is a movement here, right? We gather, we hear, you know, listen to the scripture, we listen to the message, and then we respond, whether it be com by coming together in communion or responding with baptism or some other form, joining the church, you know, something. Giving offering is a response. And then, we're not done yet. Just because you gave the offering, the worship is not done. And then you get sent forth. There is that sense of being called out into mission, into the world to serve. So how does this now relate to Hebrew in our modern church? I know. So again, technology just messes us up, or the pandemic. So yes. You don't have to, you know, get in the car and shave. Yeah, you don't have that. But you still have to 
click, 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 get it onto the TV, right? <laughs> There's still that sense as you're getting ready to participate in worship, whether you're here physically or even online, what's going through your hearts and minds as you're getting ready, right? That plays a big part on what you experience in worship. Right? So that's the whole part of the gathering, right? So, and, and then I thought, I thought you were going to be talking, talking about like communion. How are we going to do, how do you, you know, is communion the same when you do it at home individually? You know? Back when I was in seminary in the 90s, we were debating how to do communion online <laughs> through the internet. Back in the 90s, we were debating that. Um, and I remember some of our discussions were like, oh, that would never happen. <laughs> and then 2020 came along, right? All right, so again, varying amount, varying practices. But one of the things in worship, and again, it's in the context of worship. Okay, well, first of all, um, when we talk about religious practices, when, we, when, we, when I talked about Judaism, I, I spoke about how because of the history, the individual devotion and the practice of prayer was actually the starting point, central. In the Christian faith, the central element of spiritual practice is actually community. Because the Christian church grew out of the communities that were formed in the early church, the gatherings, the followers of Jesus, right, would gather in the homes or wherever, communities. And so the, the, the aspect of community, being communal, is one of the central elements of the spiritual practice. So when we look at the sacred acts, and when we say sacred acts, uh, uh, sacraments, it just means sacred acts, um, there are anywhere between two to seven sacraments, depending on which denomination. Most Christian uh, denominations acknowledge two sacraments, baptism and communion, right? But some of our Orthodox traditions and our Catholic Church also recognize five others, confirmation, penance, unction, um, which is uh, um, um, healing, um, ordination, and marriage. Okay, so, so in the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, they have seven sacraments. The way these are practiced, again, in the Christian context, it's very important that it's always practiced in the context of community. So let me, let me get um, more detailed into looking at these um, sacraments as the religious practices in uh, uh, Christianity, that's important. So baptism, uh, basically the understanding of baptism is, 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 is a threefold movement. The first movement is that there is the grace of God, right? God calling out to, to uh, all of creation to know, to have this relationship with God. There is that sense of grace of God. The second uh, movement is that we respond to that grace by choosing to be, to be baptized. What does it mean to be baptized? It means to be then initiated into the family of God or initiated into the community, which is the third movement. Um, the World Council of Churches, um, many years ago, back in the 80s, did a pretty much a study, um, got some scholars together, just like the early church, to figure out what was going to be the in the Bible, um, they got a bunch of uh, church leaders together, this is the World Council of Churches, and they published a document so that all the Christian churches in the, in the world could agree upon, this is what we mean by baptism. And they came up with these five bullet points. Baptism are these five things. One, it is the participation of Christ's death and resurrection. So when we are baptized, we acknowledge that there is this sense of um, uh, dying to ourselves and, and, and being alive to a new life or, or new self. Um, it's that death and resurrection. Two, 
Baptism is an acknowledgement of confessing our sins, receiving the pardon, and then living a new cleansed life. Three, at, in, in baptism, there is this sense of the Holy Spirit coming upon us. Four, uh, th um, that with baptism, it is the initiation into the body of Christ or that community. And, and, and five, uh, it's a sign of the new kingdom, that we are going to be members of this new kingdom, this new world that, that, that we're being established. So those are the five things. Um, now, you're probably thinking, well, that's the, what, what, is, what, is, what does that all really mean? Well, different, again, different branches of Christianity kind of focuses on different aspects of it. In terms of a practice, I'm sure we've all seen or observed or um, uh, baptism being done, and there's different ways that, that you've, I'm sure you've seen it done, right? Uh, so there's three modes of baptism. <laughs> These are the three. Um, either it's, uh, water is sprinkled, right? So, it, so in, the, in the context of baptism, there is water that is being, that is being poured or sprinkled or whatever. There, there's water involved um, with the person. And depending on the scriptural context, uh, different ch churches practice dif differently. The act of sprinkling, okay, so, so in some churches, it just takes a little bit of water on the top of their head, right? And it just takes a little bit of water because it takes the scripture context from Ezekiel that says, that says you know, um, Ezekiel quotes God saying, I will sprinkle upon you the new life, right? So it's that sprinkling. The prophet Joel talks about, I will pour out my spirit upon you. So then there is that pouring. Um, I do a combination of sprinkling and pouring where, I, uh, so the pouring, usually you get a jug and you kind of pour it on top of the person. Um, not a fire hose, but you just pour it. Um, what I do, of course, is I do the scooping, right? That, 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 that's the fourth way that I do. But then the most common image that most people have with baptism is, of course, the immersion. And the context of that is, of course, because Jesus was immersed, right? Now, what happened, again, I, I, I talked about what, what the World Council of Churches dictated as the meaning behind baptism, but um, what, the, the, you know, what happens during baptism, again, is it's, it's, the, it's the engagement with being part of a community, um, kind of testifying or, or uh, pro proclaiming in front of a community that I'm going to become a part of this worshiping community or this community of faith, right? So there is that sense of commitment that is being made. When that happens, of course, the sprinkling and the pouring kind of focuses on the Holy Spirit coming upon us, whereas the immersion kind of focuses on the death and the resurrection, right? That act of being buried under water or underground and then coming back up. Those are, those are symbolic acts. But no matter how the practice is done in, in the different churches, um, one of the uh, understanding of baptism in, in all of the Christian circles is that you only, you're only baptized once. Okay? Now, this is confusing for some churches because, like, wait a minute, I thought, you know, um, Sometimes even here, we do what is known as renewal of baptism that happens at the beginning of the year, right? And usually the words behind what I say is remember your baptism, right, for those who have been baptized. Not you're, you're being re-baptized, but remember your baptism. So what that means is that if you're baptized in one church, you're always, you're, that baptism carries to any other church. Except, there's always an exception, there are some churches that don't accept the, the other forms of um, ba uh, baptism as sprinkling or pouring. You have to be immersed. Why do you have to be immersed? Because Jesus was immersed. He did not, he, uh, water was not sprinkled upon him, nor was it poured upon him, but he was immersed. And you kind of take this again from the story of Jesus going to John the Baptist, right? And being baptized. And by the way, Baptism kind of uh, is a, 
uh, was adopted from the Jewish practice of purification. Except it's not quite a, 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 a tradition of purification right because if you remember from last week in Judaism, in order for the, the ritual of purification to be done properly, it has to be done within a pool of still water. It cannot be water that's flowing. It has to be in still water. So Jesus being baptized or you know, going into the water in the Jordan River, you can't have a purification in the Jordan River. <laughs> So it was already John, what John the Baptist was doing was different than just a straight purification rite. Um, but again, so in some churches, if you are baptized in, in sprinkling mode or, or the pouring mode, they'll tell you that um, uh, that was incomplete. And so you would have to be immersed in order to uh, be fully acknowledged that you were baptized. And then there's the whole um, act of baptism for children. In some churches, um, like our church, we, would, we baptize children, right? Why do we baptize children? And in, some, uh, in other churches, like uh, most Baptist churches, do not baptize children. They will dedicate them, they will pray for them, they will bless them, but they will not baptize children. Why? Because uh, it's, it's called believer's baptism. The emphasis there is that the individual has to make the commitment versus in infant baptism, um, the, 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 the emphasis is on the grace of God upon, the, upon, the, upon the, the child and the people surrounding the child, whether it be the parents or the guardians or, and the community, are the one that takes the commitment to raise the child. Okay? And because of that, we'll get into one of the other um, sacraments of confirmation, which the Baptist church does not have. Because baptism, um, in the Baptist church, you're only baptized when you're already old enough to make that commitment yourself. Versus um, the Catholic church or the Methodist church or the Presbyterian church will baptize as a child, and so confirmation will come. So I'll, I'll get to that. Um, so, and then Holy Communion, right? Holy Communion sometimes is called Eucharist. Eucharist basically means five, uh, the great Thanksgiving. And this is what the World Council of Churches said. These are the five meanings of Holy Communion. What happens during Holy Communion? Basically, we're giving thanks. If you listen to the words of the liturgy, it always talks about, we give you thanks, O God, for blah, 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 blah. We thank the, you know. It's called the great thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for what? It's, the, it's gi giving thanks for the community um, and the, 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 the gift of life through Jesus Christ. So it's called the great thanksgiving. The second meaning is that it is a reminder, it is a memorial of Jesus Christ. You know, it's a remembrance of his crucifixion and resurrection. The third thing is, again, if you pay attention to what happens during our communion liturgy, you know, after I say a bunch of words, I use, and, and you guys respond, I usually put out my hands and I say, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. It's a consecration, it's a blessing. Um, in the uh, in in a greater sense, what's happening is that we are invoking the Holy Spirit to bless the elements. Um, it is a communion of the faithful. That means it, it's the the it is the community of believers coming together, and that and and the last um, meaning of Holy Communion is that it is a glimpse of the great banquet, you know, the meal in the heavenly kingdom. You know, again, these are imageries, but th this, these are the, the, the symbolic meanings behind it. Now, getting more into the details of it, not all churches emphasize all, of the, all, all five aspects, right? For us, we probably focus more on the, the fact that it's a great Thanksgiving, right? And, 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 and that is, it is a community where we all, that everyone is welcome to come. But not all churches practice it that way, right? I'm sure you've all you've been to church or seen churches where um, communion is not necessarily open, right? Um, I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, one of the great debates of communion is, of course, what actually happens when you're blessing that thing, right? And that thing, the, the bread and the cup, the wine, or the juice, right? It, you know, it's the Methodist church that 
you blame it on the Methodists for, for being it's Jews, yeah. right? Yeah. Because no other churches, like the, well, actually, the other churches do it now, but it was Welsh, yeah. right? <laughs> Methodist Welsh. Um, uh, but originally, traditionally, uh, well, I don't know if it's originally, but um, in the Catholic tradition, uh, Thomas Aquinas uh, in the 14th century, 12th century, um, uh, is the one that kind of uh, gave the grounding of its interpretation that when the elements are blessed, that the elements are transformed, that the substance transforms into the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It actually becomes the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. So, so in in Orthodox or, or traditional Catholic churches, those and churches that subscribe to substantiation, believes that the elements become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, because of that, how Holy Communion is administered and practiced, observed. Uh, has a, has a significance. When, if, if you've ever gone to a, um, observed a Catholic communion, you can go, well, when, when I was in college, I didn't know any better. It was before I went to seminary. So, so my friends said, hey, let's go to uh, a Catholic mass. I'm like, oh, whatever, okay, I have nothing else better to do. So I went, and then when they went up to communion, I followed along. I didn't know. You're not supposed to if you're not Catholic. I didn't know that. But as I went there, I put out my hand, and the priest could tell I was not Catholic <laughs> because you're not supposed to touch the elements. Why? It's holy. It's, it's the body of Jesus Christ. Only the priest can touch it. All you're supposed to do is stick out your tongue, and they place it in you. You do not touch it, right? And then they serve you the cup. You don't touch the cup either. You don't grab the cup. You don't say, you don't ask for seconds either, right? <laughs> they will give you the cup. Again, why is, the, why is it practiced that way? Because of the transubstantiation. It is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So no one else can touch it. So you cannot touch it. Um, and what happens to the elements after communion, after mass is over? It has to be fully consumed, right? And so that's why... Uh, the priests, <laughs> they have to do a really good job of guesstimating how many people are going to show up for mass that day because whatever that's left over, they have to consume. Um, but again, that's a, we kind of laugh at it, but it's significant when you realize that that is the understanding of communion. It is holy in that aspect. Martin Luther in the 16, you know, 1500s, um, he said, eh, I don't know about that, right? And so he, so he basically said, if the body and blood, or if, if the bread and the wine truly transformed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ, that's kind of gross, but well, no, uh, it's, it's, sure, it's meaningful, but it doesn't taste that way. It, it sure doesn't taste like Jesus. Um, <laughs> and so he came up with the understanding of consubstantiation. Con means as in um, companion or just alongside that the substance of, um, that the essence of Jesus Christ and the substance of the bread and the, and the wine reside together, consubstance. So substance is, 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 is con, I don't know. Con, what, what's, what's the Latin word for con that's together? Anyhow, they're together. And so uh, what, what that means, is, it means with. And so, uh, um, uh, what Martin Luther said was, the elements, the essence, is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It's holy. It is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But to, to you know, the, by the grace of God, we don't have to taste it that way. And so the bread and the wine, we taste the bread and the wine, even though the essence is Jesus Christ. So that's what the, tra the consubstantiation means. Same thing. Once communion is over, it, all the elements has, still has to be consumed or buried. It doesn't have to be consumed. It can be buried. But it's done in a way that acknowledges this is the body and um, blood of Jesus Christ in its essence. Not in its physical form, but in its essence. 
And so either it's consumed by a person or um, ceremonially buried. And so usually there's a garden in the back of the church, you can just bury it. Um, the third, of course, is the remembrance, where, where uh, uh, the elements are symbolic. It's a remembrance of Jesus Christ's act, you know, gathering his disciples, and, and we remember um, the significance of it. And even, when though, even though I say, you know, pour out your Holy Spirit on, on, on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup and make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, redeem, um, make them be for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, that we may be the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. Even though those are the words spoken, we know that that's just symbolic. <laughs> right? That it doesn't really become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But it is still, we still uh, treat it or, or observe it as with reverence. The holiness is in the moment, not the element. Right? And so, yes, occasionally a bread will drop on the floor. I will pick it up, right? Um, again, sometimes we have too, too many leftovers. What do we do with that? Well, we don't really bury it. The, 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 the juice, we may just pour it outside. But you know, um, I know in my previous church, after communion, um, I would always call the youth up because we always use Hawaiian bread and the youth would be like really happy. And, and they would come and they would, Gobble it up. Great. Um, sometimes it's just way too much, and it kind of stays in the back sacristy for a while. And what happens to it? So what do you do with it? We throw it away. We compost it. Okay, that's a good way of saying it. <laughs> um, but we do it with respect. But we're not, we're not confined to... Uh, making sure that every, every crumb is consumed, right? So the practice of it is different, right? And, be, and again, because of the practice, um, the way we do it, of course, we give it out, we place it in people's hands, and you can touch it, you can, you know, you can chew it, you know, whatever. Um, also, again, one of the un understandings of communion was that it, it was the communion of the faithful in the Catholic Church, like I said, um, communion is closed. Okay, it's only for those who are uh, part of the Catholic Church and some other branches of churches too. It's only for those who have been baptized, or it's only for those who are part of their community. There's a sense of you know that it, it makes it in a way it's very special that it's only for selected few. It's like the membership. Uh, we practice it a little differently here. Um, I, I do this whole spiel about, uh, in the Methodist Church, we observe what is known as open communion. And because for us, again, the emphasis, emphasis is not on the, that is for the select believers or the closed community. The emphasis is on the grace of God. Everything that we do, the way we do baptism, is focuses on the grace of God. Right? And so communion, the focus is on the grace of God, and because it's a focus on the grace of God, it means that you don't have to, you don't have to worry that you, whether you check the right box and you've fulfilled a certain criteria. The grace of God is the grace of God. It goes to anyone because it's the grace of God. Right? There is no like, oh yeah, oh, you, only if you're dot, 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 you're accepted. No. The grace of God means everyone is loved and accepted. And that's why that drives how we practice our Holy Communion. Ooh, okay. <laughs> we did have a late start because of this thing, but okay. Um, let, me, let me go through other sacraments real quick and then I'm, I wanna uh, kind of give you, well, a couple of things. So the other sacraments that, again, in the Catholic Church, in the Orthodox Church, they um, observe as sacred acts, sacraments, is, um, well, this one was confirmation, right? So in the Methodist Church, we also do confirmation, and it is a special time. We have a special worship service for our youth who are confirmed, um, but it is not considered a sacrament because Jesus Christ didn't get confirmed. That's the different, differentiating line. Did Jesus Christ do it, right? 
it is still important, but confirmation is very important, again, um, uh, for churches that observe, uh, that, that, that baptize infants. Because again, what happens at confirmation is that the individual, the child, grows to a certain age, and it is the, it is the, the, um, the, um, the, um, the, the flip, flip side of the Jewish practice of bar, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, right? Is the coming of age. And the coming of age in the Christian um, faith is that at, the, at that age, 13, give or take, they have the mental capacity to understand. They go through a class, confirmation class, or catechism. And then afterwards, they claim for themselves the promise that their guardian or their parent claimed at, when they were baptized as an infant. So whether then the, the parents saying, yes, I promise to raise this child in a Christian home, at confirmation, the individual, the, uh, the, the teenager now, then says, I am committing myself to walk in the Christian faith. So that's what the confirmation does. So it is a special um, um, observance, but it is not necessarily sacred, uh, sacrament in the Methodist church, but uh, in the Catholic church, it, it is a sacrament. Oh, uh, what is that? Confession, right? Um, confession of booth, right? That is a sacrament in the Catholic Church. To go to confession, penance, is a, is a sacrament. Why is it a sacrament in the, in the Catholic Church? Because you have to engage with the priest um, who is ordained and confess your sins, and then the priest will then um, absolve your sins, right? In the Protestant Church, we don't have uh, penance. Now, we encourage confession, <laughs> It's good for the soul, but it's not a sacred act because um, in, in the Protestant church, we don't have a hierarchy to pray to God. You know, you can confess your sins to God directly or whatever, and, you know, it's between you and God, <laughs> right? Um, the, 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 the pastor does not need to know about all your little sins. It's just between you and God. I will bless you no matter what. <laughs> Okay, but that's that. Um, unction or, or healing, right? Uh, the Greek word is sozo, and the word sozo is actually also the same word that, that gets derived into the word salvation. And so um, uh, the, the ointment or the anointing of the sick is a sacrament in the Catholic Church. It is also a sacred act. When I visit folks, especially um, as they're approaching the end of... Uh, uh, end of life in the hospital or what, whatnot, I usually carry uh, my anointing oil with me and I bless them. Um, uh, holy unction, or the ultimate unction, is at the point of death, right? And that's, um, now, it's, it's the same uh, sacrament of um, anointing the sick. Now, what does it do to anoint the sick when they're dying? Well, the sick is not only about the physical body, but the soul. And so at, at the at Holy Unction, um, usually there is a confession and then a, an absolution of, of all the sins. And then there is then is, um, uh, the healing of the soul so that they may depart in peace. That's what happens in Holy Unction. Um, I don't do the same thing, but there is something about anointing at the final stage that um, I, oftentimes I observe uh, folks that are at the end of life, this complete sense of, and I can't tell you how many times um, um, I would go and someone may be just hanging on, right? And I usually encourage folks who are at the end stage, um, you know, pray for them, uh, reminding them the grace of God, the love of God, giving thanks to the, the family and to um, the life that they had lived. Um, and then at the point of anointing, it is, um, again, just reminding them that they, their whole, everything of who they are is loved by God. And I whisper into, I usually whisper into the person the words that Jesus Christ, you know, says, you know, to in some of the parables, um, well done, 
my good and faithful servant, enter into my kingdom. And I can't tell you how many times when I say those words, <laughs> um, th- there's, this, there's this sign of relief, and usually the person passes within the next 24 hours. Because a lot of times people hang on. Because they don't know, they don't, they're not sure, uncertainty. But just hearing those words, giving that sense of peace and relief, allows them to just say, okay, I trust in the grace of God. And then they let go and they just enter into God's kingdom. There's something powerful in that. For me, it is sacred. In the Methodist church, yeah, it's, it's, it's a sacred act, but in the Catholic church, it's definitely one of the sacraments. Is that, is that also at the point of extreme unction? Yes, extreme unction. is at the point of death, yeah. Um, uh, ordination is also a sacrament in the Catholic Church because um, when a person is ordained, especially in the Catholic Church, the priests are set apart to live a life um, wholly dedicated to God, and therefore the reason for not marrying is so that they can dedicate their whole life to God and not worry about you know, going home and fighting with your spouse or whatever. So... Um, <laughs> So, so the, the act of ordination is a sacrament. Um, and then marriage. Now, why is marriage, matrimony, a sacrament in the Catholic Church? Well, it has to do with the, the whole connotation of, in biblical scripture, um, uh, talking about the church is the bride of Jesus and the, Jesus, the bridegroom. So the relationship of of, of us and God is, or, or us and Jesus is, th- is this marital sim- um, uh, symbol. Of, uh, marriage is a symbol of that relationship. And so the actual commitment of marriage is, is held up as a sacrament because when two individuals take that marital uh, covenant or, or vow, they are, they are living out the um, the relationship of the church with Jesus. So that's why it's considered a sacrament. All right, one last thing. Uh, or actually, no, two last things. One last, no. Oh. So a lot of these practices are done in the context of worship, and in the worship, in the Christian church, there is what is known as a Christian calendar, right? And you probably, I don't know if you've noticed that um, occasionally, uh, no, right now, our beautiful altar is in the color of the rainbow um, because of the beetles, but um, throughout the year, usually the, the sails change colors according to the season. The Christian calendar starts four weeks before Christmas. It is the season of Advent. I'm sure many of you know that. The color is purple, okay? Um, and, and, and the whole, um, con- uh, whole the purpose of the focus of Advent is it is a season of preparation, getting ready for the birth of, you know, of Jesus Christ. But um, Advent is not just... Oh, there's more pages. Okay. Um, Advent is not just about the birth of, you know, um, the first coming of Jesus Christ. Advent is also a time when it focuses on the end times, the coming of the the kingdom. Um, And so Advent is a time of preparation, anticipation, and a longing um, to to welcome both celebrate the the birth of Jesus Christ, what we call the first coming, and the second coming. And I use quotes, okay, because... There's multiple understandings, and, 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 and I'm, I'm not talking literal forms. Um, but the future kingdom, the future kingdom, right? And so uh, Advent is a time when we acknowledge that there is the hope and the anticipation and the prayers. And, and usually the scriptures that we read are uh, some of the passages in Isaiah that talks about this this vision. Uh, I think we, I used the same scripture for imagine. Um, of a, of a world where there is peace, you know? 
And so um, Advent is a time of, of that anticipation. And then comes Christmas. Of course, Christmas is the celebration of, uh, yes, Jesus' birth. But, and, and the color that we use is white um, um, because it, it is, the white is for holiness. The, the observance of Christmas and, and the season of Christmas lasts 12 days, like as in the song. Um, okay, the, uh, Christmas came first before the song. And, and so, but the, so the focus of Christmas is the gift, not the presents that we share, you know, not St. Nicholas' presents, but the gift of Jesus, that Jesus is the incarnation, the gift of God's ultimate reality somehow incarnating in Jesus and revealing for us God's presence. That is a gift, whether it be the revelation or the person, that gift. It celebrates that gift. That's what Christmas is about, celebrating the incarnation of, of Jesus as a gift. Um, and then comes Epiphany, right? It's the season of um, Christmas and then enter into Epiphany. And Epiphany, the color is green. And the reason why it's green is because green is the color of growth. And the season of Epiphany, um, usually the scriptures that are, uh, um, that, that are, that's in the lectionary, has to do with the life and teachings of Jesus to help us grow in our faith, to learn about Jesus' life and his teachings, his ministry, as a way of growing in faith. Um, in, the, in the Epiphany season, uh, we also have, uh, and Epiphany always starts in January 6th, by the way, which kind of has a different connotation now, but, um, <sighs> but it uh, usually lasts about six to eight weeks, depending on when Easter falls. But the last week of Epiphany is Transfiguration Sunday. And Transfiguration Sunday is the Sunday when we read the passage where Jesus takes uh, Peter, James, and John up to the mountain and he transfigures and reveals his, his full nature or his, his glorified nature, right? Uh, oh, oh, oh. It's, it's that sense of revelation. The word epiphany means revelation. It means, aha, eureka, right? And so the whole season of epiphany is about learning. The light bulb's going off. And so the, um, th that, that's what gets celebrated. And then uh, after epiphany, we enter into the season of Lent, right? So, you know, Advent to Epiphany is actually one phase of our Christian growth. We prepare, we celebrate Jesus' you know, uh, birth, and then we learn to grow in our Christian faith. The second phase is Lent, Easter, into Pentecost. And what happens there is, of course, then Lent is the preparation for Easter. And of course, this, this time it's not four weeks, it's 40 days, not including Sundays, because every Sunday is considered a mini version of Easter. So, so, so even on, during the season of Lent, you can eat chocolate <laughs> on Sundays. <laughs> All right? Whatever you gave up, Sunday's a free day. <laughs> You didn't know that, huh? <laughs> Sundays is a free day. So, um, but it's 40 days, not including Sunday. And so it starts on Ash Wednesday, which is the, the ultimate day of penitence, right? So we have um, ash, we talk about ashes. We, um, we go through the ceremonial ritual of placing the ashes on our forehead as a reminder that, yes, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, from the earth we came to the earth we will return. That our you know, our physical form is nothing, no different than the dust of the earth. But there is also then the recognition that, um, as Apostle Paul would say, we, there's that duality within us. We are body and the spirit. And the spirit is part of God. And so um, Lent is the 40 days of preparation as we get before uh, Easter. And then the week, final week before Easter, of course, we have our Holy Week. And so we journey with Jesus. So usually on that final week, all the stories kind of focus, in, focus on the, uh, the fi Jesus' final week, you know, before, um, before crucifix be crucifixion and the resurrection. If you look at the Gospels, Ma Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, about half of, their, of the scripture is that final week. The Gospel of John has 21 chapters. 
That final week starts on chapter 11. From 11 to 20 is that final week. And then 21 is the resurrection. So, well, 20 is the resurrection, but 21 is like when he has breakfast. But anyhow. Um, so, so you have that, right? It's, it's, it's uh, you have, Oh, yeah, the Holy Week. And then, of course, you have Easter. And then, uh, of course, Easter, we all know, it's, a, it's the observance of celebrating uh, the resurrection. It lasts 49 days. Why 49? Seven of seven, seven, seven weeks of seven, you know. But it's primarily because Pentecost is celebrated on the 50th day. Now, why, what's the significance of that? Nothing other than the fact that, that that's from our Jewish tradition, and we just adopted it. Um, but the Christian understanding of Pentecost has a, has a, has a, a, a twist to it. Um, so after seven weeks of uh, observing, hearing stories of Jesus' resurrection and his encounter, of the, the resurrected Jesus encountering with uh, disciples and other folks, and Jesus hangs around for 40 days. Numbers are very significant. I should do a whole class. We should do a class on just numerology in the Bible, right? 40 days. Really? Was it actually 40 days? No. I mean, what's with the 40? It just means a very long time. 40 just means a long time. It, it, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. It rained for a long time. You know, the Israelites traveled through the wilderness for 40 years. It was a long time. Did that just, 40 <laughs> 40 just means a long time. So Jesus was with us for a long time. But in the Christian calendar, um, after 40 days is the day of ascension when we, uh, um, we observe Jesus then leaving planet Earth to, I don't know where. But anyhow, the ascension. Bill preached on this last year, and so he can tell you all about the ascension and the connection with Maya. <laughs> Anyhow, um, and then you have the season of Pentecost. And the Pentecost, of course, in the Jewish tradition was the uh, festival of Sukkot, which is the um, harvest, um, uh, feast of booths. In other words, uh, giving thanks to God for uh, sheltering the Israelites as they journey through the wilderness. That's what Pentecost is all about in the Jewish tradition. In the Christian tradition, that took a totally different connotation because of the story in Acts chapter 2 of what happens on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes down, empowers the disciples. They're no longer scared and, and, and just hiding out in the upper room, but they now then start going out and sharing the message, uh, the story of Jesus, right? That's Acts chapter 2. And so Pentecost in the Christian context is now seen as the birth of the church. And again, as I was saying, in the Christian faith, the whole basis of all of our practice is community. And the church is all about the, starting with the disciples coming together and then going out and creating these communities. And so, um, and then the Pentecost season um, is celebrated anywhere between one day or six months. Um, some churches only put on the red for Pentecost Sunday and, and never seen again until next Pentecost. I like red. And so I usually keep the red until midway through um, because from Pentecost to Advent, it's called ordinary time. Or sometimes it's you, the word is, what kind of a name is that, ordinary time? Yeah, nothing really happens during that time. So no. summer happens, but... But it's, what, what color is it? Green. green. What does green represent? Growth. Growth. It means that after all this, you know, story of, of you know, the preparation and then um, uh, preparation, birth of Jesus, and then, uh, and then learning the story of Jesus, preparing for, you know, Easter, um, stories of Jesus' resurrection, and, and then celebrating the birth of the church, the rest of the year, half the year, it's all about, okay, now what do you do with all that? figure out how to grow in our faith, right? And so you have all kinds of stories in there. Um, sometimes it's also called kingdom tide, okay? Basically, we're living in the kingdom, living out our faith in whatever context, in worship, out in the world, in mission, 
service, whatnot. Um, in that ordinary time, you have a couple of special Sundays. You have Trinity Sunday, which is the Sunday after Pentecost, which we talk about the theology of the Trinity, which nobody understands. Um, and then you also have on November, All Saints. We'll have that in a few weeks. Um, and then the last Sunday of ordinary time is called Christ the King Sunday. And that's usually the Sunday right before Advent starts. And it's the culmination of the whole Christian year. And it's usually a celebration of that Jesus Christ is king. Now, not, I'm not talking about a, a monarchy or a ruler, you know, a t tyrannical ruler, but just Jesus Christ is king in terms of he is, you know, that he is the one that we follow in uh, exemplifying the life that we choose to live, that type of thing. And so that is the Christian calendar, and that is the practice of the Christian faith. All right. That's a lot. Okay, one last slide. <laughs> Pew research. Remember? So um, th this was done a, a few years ago, um, um, right before COVID. Two-thirds of U.S. adults who typically attend religious services monthly say that they had done so in person in the last month. Huh. Um, well, actually, no, this, is, uh, this was done last year. Um, and it says of all adults in July of 2020, well, of course, we're in the middle of the pandemic, uh, still 13% went to worship in person in July of 2020. Um, 13 uh huh. Uh, in March of 2022, so last year, March, so pandemic, you know, everything was opened up so far. But only 27% of all of, of all the people who claim themselves to be Christian, only 27% attend worship service in person in the United States. Yep. How many people watch online? In July of 2020, 36%. Okay? Well, that's impressive, but then you start thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Church wasn't open. So what happened to all the rest of the people? What happened to the, you know, okay, 13% were coming in person. 36% was watching online. Where's the other 50%? That's true, too. That is true, yeah. But half the people during COVID just went dormant in, their, in, the, in terms of worship. Um, but in March of 2022, again, everything opened up. 27% came back in person. But online just kind of still kept steady to 30%. 30% still watch online. We have, so our average worship service kind of varies somewhere between 150 to 180 um, in person. And online, on Sunday morning, we have anywhere between 30 or 40 people online. But throughout the week, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of people who don't watch it um, at the hour because of internet issues a lot of times. Um, or NFL, or something, yeah. you know, we, we get a whole bunch of people watching it in the you know, middle of the night for some reason. I think they just need to go to sleep and need help. Um, and so, but uh, throughout the week, we get, Mike, how many hits do we normally get in a given week between the live and then the edited? I don't keep track of the service on YouTube live. <laughs> We have, between the two, we have about anywhere between 70, well, between the two combined, about 100 people, or 100 uh, unique clicks. So who are these people? I have no idea. That's why I keep saying, you know, in the, in the worship service, when I greet people, please sign in, because I have no idea who you are. But so we have, you know, give or take, let's say, you know, there's the random people that's always clicking away, and that's why we have about 100. So let's say half of them, there's about 50 people that are watching with us online still. And then we have about 170 people here. 
You know, though, it's interesting, young people are coming back. There was an incident um, down at Auburn University, mm -hmm. and he gave a, gave a talk, and they said, we want to be baptized. So they found the pond, oh. a pond, to do the baptism, and about 200 kids were baptized. Oh, wow. Oh yes, this was during the um, the um, the revival. Yeah. Yes, this was during the revival movement that happened last yeah. the, earlier this year, March of this year. Yeah, in, fe in February February of this year, the, the, something crazy happened in Kentucky um, and in the in that region. Um, uh, Asbury Seminary or Asbury University started, and all of a sudden they had their regular midweek uh, worship service, and then. Um, Usually it's an hour, but then kids started throwing in, and then someone that said, oh, I'll just you know, keep on singing, and then more people, and so even after the hour, more people just kept coming in, so they didn't stop, and it just kept coming and coming, and then after, you know, 24 hours later, it's still going, and then like three days later, it kept going. After a week, the, um, the leaders are like, I'm tired. <laughs> um, but the other people that were coming in said, oh, yeah, you know, take, a, take a break, we'll take over. And it just kept going. It went for three weeks, nonstop. Finally, the university authorities had to say, OK, liability insurance reasons, that they had to, to close it down. But what happened then was that the, the kids, you know, um, these are all university students. They then, um, by that time, it was like live streaming everything and stuff like that. And so then um, other universities, it started to spark these revivals in other universities. So it was, a, it was a pretty crazy phenomenon back in February of this year. It only takes a spark. It only takes a spark. Yeah. Anyhow, well, thank you for joining me. Sorry, it ran late. Hey, you know, the Christians, they're too big, too much. <laughs> All right, next week, Dr. Bill will take over. <laughs>